history tends to get told by the winners. But in actual fact, what's happening right now is a repeating of history. We're just kind of doing it in reverse. Because it's often shown that Carl Benz was the first one to create a motor car. But actually, Carl Benz was quite late to the market. By the time Carl Benz, which is part of Mercedes Benz, had put his car on the road, it was 1886. He kind of showed the prototype of it in 1885, but actually by that point, there was a lot of cars on the road already. They were just steam powered and electric powered. In 1832, a man named Robert Anderson, who was from Scotland, made the first prototype electric car. Now he made it using what's called primary cells, which aren't rechargeable. But you know what? The proof of concept was actually pretty good. What happened to Robert Anderson afterwards is very sketchy. No one's quite sure, but another couple of years before another Scottish man did more with that electric power. So at the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic, a fella called Thomas Davenport discovered the same basic principle, portable battery, electric motor. But he decided to focus more on trams than on electric transport. So this wasn't the end of the story at all. A French man called Gustave Trouvé got involved Gustav actually created the first rechargeable battery. Now, he didn't do motors, so he called a company called Siemens to come and help him out with the motor. The connection Trouvé made with Siemens allowed him to get in touch with a man called James Stanley, who had already made a tricycle, put the whole lot together to create the world's first electric vehicle. Trouvé was a very impressive inventor. He went on to create an electric outboard motor. He also miniaturized his electric motor to power a model airship, a dental drill, a sewing machine, a razor. The man was not only prolific, he was an amazing inventor. So for around the next 50 years, basically every cab in London was electric. 90% of the cabs in New York were also electric. But there's a rather big problem with this electricity thing. It's really only available in cities. So electric cars had no gearbox. They didn't smell. They weren't stinking like a horse. They weren't getting tired. They needed to be recharged, sure, but that was it. And unlike steam cars at the time, which by the way, were also on sale, they didn't take 45 minutes to get warm in the morning when you light a fire, and they didn't gobble water, which is the biggest problem with steam. It was not very efficient in the first place. But the question still remained of what to do about the electricity. By this time, of course, Carl Benz had indeed got on the scene with his petrol-powered motor. That required hand cranking from the back. You had to spin a big wheel with your hand, which was dangerous. A lot of people didn't want to get involved with that sort of thing. The problem for everyone was these cars were one-offs. And if they weren't one-offs, if they were actually being built in a factory, they were coach-built. It made them all very, very expensive. It was at a time where there wasn't a lot of money around, and people really did actually want transport. And yet, this was out of the reach of most. And our old friend Rudolf Diesel wouldn't appear on the scene yet till about 1900 at the World's Fair in Paris, where he showed his first engine, the diesel engine, running on peanut oil. Even if we zoom forward a few years in 1889, a young man called Ferdinand Porsche would invent his first car. It was called a Porsche P1. It was actually fully electric. He named it a Porsche P1, but it was also called the Edgar Loner. It's probably why they didn't call it a Porsche Taycan, the Edgar Loner. It might not sell quite so much. But it was definitely the first electric car that Porsche had ever made, the first car he'd ever made. And then he went on to make a hybrid version of that car as well. The problem still existed that the roads of the United States, or even the roads of most of Europe, couldn't really handle these skinny little wheeled cars outside of it. And if you add to that, the biggest problem we had was getting electricity. Nobody needed it. You didn't need it in your house to make the house run, so nobody really bothered with it. That was until another man got involved, Thomas Edison. In 1879, Thomas Edison brought out the electric light bulb, and it was so successful that electricity began to go to every home in the United States. This was the cure for fires. Everybody was using lamps and oil lamps and fires were quite common and suddenly the electric light bulb was solving all of that. By 1890, Thomas Edison decided to make a better and longer lasting battery, specifically for cars. Edison was actually spending the next 10 years developing a battery 
that would go further, was lighter, was more efficient. He called upon all the expertise he had in his workshop at the time. One of those experts, Mr. Edison would go on to encourage to start into the car industry. That man's name? Henry Ford. Ford had worked for Edison for a good number of years. Ford had quite a bit of experience in other fields as well. He'd worked in tin mines and tin plants and things that had made individual pieces by specialist people. So he had quite a bit of experience with it. In his off time while working for Edison, he actually kind of manufactured some prototypes and stuff. And in 1896, he showed one to Edison. Edison was so impressed by these prototypes that Ford had been designing in the background that he encouraged Ford to open a car plant. And by 1903, Ford did indeed open the Ford Motor Company. You see, making a car back then was no easy thing. Really, what they did was they got four or five men to stand around the car and continually build it until there was nothing left. And then they'd move on to another car. They could only really produce like one car a week. And even then, that car was really expensive. Around the turn of the century, the average American industrial wage was between $200 and $400 a year. The average price of an electric car was $1,700. So most of these personal transport items were well out of the reach of the ordinary individual. So $1,700 for a single car, electric, that you can only use in the city? That was beyond the means of most people. That's why Ford decided he was going to make cars much cheaper. The Ford Motor Company started out with a simple idea. Let's create a production line to make cars, so an individual person would deal with the left seat and another person with the right seat of the same car. This improved things so much so that by 1914, the Ford Model T was outselling all of the car industry combined. On a little side note to history here, you can have the Model T in about eight or nine colors. Ford never said the words, you can have it any color you want as long as it's black. Herein begins the end of the electric car, really, because Ford Model T, which was the most popular car you could have in the US at the time, that could be on your drive for $200 to $400. It was a small amount of money for a full-size car to carry your whole family. There was no restrictions at the time. You didn't have to have seat belts. You could have as many people as you wanted in the car. You could have the roof on, you had the roof off. You could have whatever you wanted. It was pretty straightforward. The equivalent electric car $1,700 to $3,000. So really the electric car was just really expensive in comparison to that straight up petrol or piston engine car. But let's not run away with ourselves here. Because in 1914, there's an article written in the New York Times. It's written by Ford himself. Ford said in the article, Within a year, I hope that we shall begin the manufacture of an electric automobile. I don't like to talk about things which are a year ahead, but I'm willing to tell you of my plans. The fact is that Mr. Edison and I have been working for some years on an electric automobile which would be cheap and practicable. Cars have been built for experimental purposes, and we are satisfied now that the way is clear to success. The problem so far has been to build storage battery of light weight which would operate for long distances without recharging. Mr. Edison has been experimenting with such a battery for some time. See, in that article, Ford actually says that within a year, they would have a prototype. Within a year? That meant they'd already put in three or four years work, right? Ford was kind of telling porky pies at the time. They had a kind of a prototype, but nothing like what it needed. In actual fact, Ford was completely determined to use Edison's batteries. Edison's batteries were just not up to the task at all. They couldn't provide enough power for most of these cars to go uphill. <laughs> it just didn't work. But Ford had sunk 1.5 million US dollars into Thomas Edison's batteries. They had to work. Edison's batteries were nickel iron, also known as nickel alkaline. They were pretty good for what you wanted to do, but to power an electric car is a whole different ballgame. It needed to be much, much bigger. 
and really whether it could make the car go or make it go uphill was really in question all of the time. In an interview Thomas Edison gave to a magazine called Automobile Topics in 1914, he kind of blamed Henry Ford for any sort of delay that might happen in the near future. But a very interesting quote he came out with at the time, which I will quote now. I believe that ultimately the electric motor will be universally used for trucking in all large cities and that the electric automobile will be the family carriage of the future. All trucking must come to electricity. I am convinced and it will not be long before the trucking of New York City will be electric. Edison was really confident that there was a car in the making, that it was nearly ready, that it was almost on the way. Cars at the time were really hard to drive. There was handbrakes, there was pedals, there were steering wheels, there was tillers. They were all really difficult. So everybody wanted electric cars. The news reached Australia and New Zealand in their papers as to what this Ford Edison electric car was going to bring to the world. But then, a few other little things along the way. One of them was a fire in Edison's warehouse. The fire in Edison's plant took more than half the plant. 10 buildings were gone, just wiped out. And then Edison decided he was gonna save just two little pieces of it, the experimental laboratory and the battery buildings. Edison managed to get the whole thing rebuilt by the following spring. So exactly what caused the fire, nobody seems to want to talk about. But from that moment in history right there, the electric car for Ford and Edison seemed to fall off a cliff. But because Ford, now the richest company on earth, had said that his prototype was only a year away, that he was going to make a very cheap, affordable car, and he had a head start with Edison there. Do you know, I don't think anyone else wanted to invest in the electric engine. I don't think anyone else wanted to invest in anything to do with batteries. It's like, I don't think so. I'm not going to compete with Ford and Edison, two incredibly rich people. Why would you want to compete there? But something altogether bigger was coming at the Americans, something they had no control over, something that was happening in Europe that they were going to get dragged into whether they liked it or not. By summer 1914, World War I was declared, and by that autumn, the Americans were involved in it. I'll leave you with this tantalizing thought. What if Henry Ford had it got somebody else to make the batteries? What if he wasn't so determined to push into Edison's battery and, and make that happen? What if he'd have used a proper power source? What if the Model T, or the next model he created, or the Model Z, was electric powered and succeeded? Where would we be now? Where would Ford be now? It's an amazing, tantalizing thought into the future. I think the next 10 years is going to change absolutely everything on Earth and it's such an exciting time to be alive. It's such an exciting event that are happening around us right now. I have rediscovered nature during this pandemic and I mean in a big way, in a big way. I really do respect what our bees and birds and our little plants and our little butterflies that are passing by, I, I just respect what they're trying to do now and I hope we continue to respect that and at the same time I want us to keep developing good products that give people good choice and value for money. I hope the electric car actually succeeds because if it does, it will save the petrol and diesel cars that are good and worth saving out there because that's what the electric car did the first time for horses. Thank you very much for joining in for this episode. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button and I'll make more. That's kind of how it works around here. You can join us every Sunday on the Sunday service if you want as well as a two hour live stream that I host every Sunday. There's a list of links down below if you want to support the channel and you want to support what I'm trying to do here with these educational documentaries. Thank you again for watching. And until the next time, I will see you on the far side. Where did I park the car?